Matt Warshaw, welcome back to the show. Thank you, David. I think this is our fourth one. Do we have anything left to say? We could talk about your first wave today. My first wave was the, yeah, it was a, <laughs> what we were at, uh, what was that secret spot called again? It is, a, we will not name it. You can't name it, no. I mean, it's a joke to call it a secret spot because it's literally, uh, you could see it on PCH, but the parking uh, is such a way that nobody's willing to park and then walk half a mile or a mile but to the spot. Let's also, let's also at least say that we were in the, we're, we're in, we in Orange County or is this? Sure. Did, we're in Orange County and we did surf alone today in really, really fun. Totally. Waves. Totally. So. And perfect conditions. Good it's us, a sunny, right? it's a, it's a vacation week. It's Thanksgiving week. So people aren't working. Sunny, light breezy offshore, perfect conditions, yeah. nobody up. My, uh, my, my, my mother-in-law is one of those people who at Thanksgiving, uh, you just sit there and you wait for it. She's going to say, okay, that's, everyone has to say what they're thankful for. Mm -hmm. And now I have something, I don't have to say something made up thing about my wife and kids. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did it. We got it on. No, that first wave you got on. I know. I know. I know. So talk I'm about talk, it. I'm not going to talk about my own first wave. Come on now. You did talk about it earlier. You said it was the best wave you've gotten in four years. But that's not a comment on how good the wave was. That's a comment on what... How good of a surfer you are. No, not how good of a surfer. It's, it's a comment on that when I surf these days, it's usually in Manhattan Beach in, uh, in waist-high closeouts. So today, we surfed waist-to-shoulder high <laughs> waves that weren't closed out. For I mean, the, it doesn't, like, the, bar, the bar's pretty low. I know, I know. But that first wave did go from where I caught it all the way till the wave ended many many yards down the beach ankle deep water i'd say yeah and um and i did you know if you're a formerly good surfer like i am you the thing you can do the thing that doesn't leave you is you just stand up and trim and put the back tuck the back knee in a little bit mm. and just make yourself look like a guy that used to surf well it's not that's you know that's yeah. where i go so I, I you trim with the knee tucked in a little bit and you pretend like you're just cruising along then you saw what happened the second wave. I tried to get fancy and turn, and I fell. <laughs> so, um, that's all you really want to do in surfing, though, anyways, right? At this point, it is. You know, I, or, or even in the beginning, like throughout, that's what you want to do. Sam George once wrote a piece. Uh, I don't know if it was in Surfing or Surfer, because he worked at, he edited both. But he wrote something that I thought was outrageous when I read it. And the older I get, the more it makes sense, which is that most of us surf the way we do because people are watching us. So... If nobody was watching, if you were just out all by yourself, we'd all be just taking it a lot easier and just riding along, you know. Or if it's not that someone's watching you, it's because you're practicing for when somebody is going to be watching you. So if you remove all that and don't care, you end up surfing just like I did on that first wave. That's a great point. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. Um, yeah. Tell the listeners what you were riding. I was riding uh, an eight-foot triple step up swallowtail uh, made by Don Kotawaki, who's been making boards for me since the 80s. It's not my board. It's my, my longtime best pal, Mark Theodore's board, and he loans it to me when I ride, I'm in town. And I can't ride a fun board, and I definitely can't ride a long board, but I've always liked riding big, long, full race guns in tiny ways because I, I know my feet know where to go. And so I was riding, at eight, I was riding a board that somebody... Somebody would have ridden not at really, really giant big sunset. Mm -hmm. Actually, what am I ocean saying? Ocean beach. Yeah, that's that's a, it's a good ocean beach board, right? Yeah. So, um, and that's, small fins too, by the way. Those were small fins. I don't yeah. know. I can't even tell. Yeah. Um, it's the did most. I the, did I have the fins in the right way? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> uh, it was the most unlikely board choice that I've ever seen. Like, I would never think to ride that. Board. I've never ridden a board like that, to be honest, because I've never ridden waves that require a board like that. But it was the perfect board. It's just, a, it's just a different version of a fun board. It's just a lot of... It's uh, narrower it's a lot of, and pointier. Right, narrow and pointier, but it's a lot of volume, and uh, the nose doesn't catch. And yeah. it... I, I don't know. I, I, I never rode anything except uh, whatever the performance boards were through all the eras that I surfed in. And I never developed... You have to ride... I, never, I could never ride a fish. I could never ride a mini... Uh, like a small longboard. I couldn't, I cooked out every possible time I experimented with boards, I cooked out. But I always had a bunch of boards in my quiver and I could ride all of those. I could, 
I didn't ride the small ones in big ways, but if I could, I could take any of the bigger boards right. and <clears throat> be perfectly comfortable on them in, in small ways. So in Ocean Beach, I used to always in summer when it was just barely breaking, um, ride my biggest board, my 8.6. Okay. The board that I would ride at the beach when it was huge, huge. I would ride that in two foot weights and had a, I would have a ball on it. So that's what that is today. It's just another version of it. And the waves were basically a right sandbar, mm -hmm. kind of like, almost like a point break, but a sand bottom. Right. Um, and shoulder high. So, but I'm paddling out. You paddle out first. I'm paddling out. And the freaking within two minutes of being, of paddling out, the wave that we had seen from the beach, which is why we chose to surf there, comes straight to you. And I'm like, oh, Matt's got a chance here. It looks like it's going to be a pretty fun day because we're going to get a bunch of these. Turns out that was the only one. That well, came. that was, but, yeah, that's a But you spun, and I know you haven't surfed in a fair bit, and for the last few years you haven't been surfing for a while. So I'm like, I don't expect anything of you, but you just spun, casually get to your feet, cruise down the line, crap, like, I don't know if you cracked it, but you definitely like got in a little comfortable turn or two, yeah. just boom, maybe floated a section or two cruise, perfect style, perfectly ridden. That board couldn't do more than what you made it do. Nailed it. I think that, uh, if you, uh, um, still got it, there's, there's a certain, there's a certain, uh, uh, core level of, of that I learned that I think that I would be able to do, even if I was sort of like 90 and if, if you could just prop me up, yeah, I could just sort of do it. Yeah. The hard part for me, you know, like all the things we've said, I, I don't have much stamina anymore. I don't have a, I don't have a, a, a fourth or fifth gear when I paddle anymore. Right. You know, it, but, but there's a certain, like, like if I redo, if I forget about really trying to go hard off the top or if I forget about any kind of like trying to do anything to reboundy with anything, like if I'm just doing the, the basic slide up and down that tuck back knee, I think I can do that until, um, until the, you know, I, I slip, I slip my coil. Well, the thing that everybody who's aging and I ask how they continue surfing. The pop-up. The pop-up is what gets them. Pop-ups. I didn't go on two waves today because I knew I was just going to poke it if I tried, you know, I, you, I, don't, I don't know. I don't even know why it should be. I mean, if I, if I drop down here on the floor right now, I feel like I can pop up fine. But when I'm, you know. I, it's confidence. I think it is confidence. If, so honestly, you should get down on the floor, not here, but on your own time and continue to practice that when you're not surfing. And that's what wave key is, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know Brad calls me about that and I should, I should give him more time. I just, I, I don't, I actually, the thing is, David, I don't want to care anymore about it. I just want like, so today I wasn't going to come to this. You said I was supposed to go see somebody else for uh, lunch and that got pushed back till tomorrow. So I thought, oh, I'm going to take David up on this invite and go surf, but I didn't think it was going to be that fun. So I just like this, that wave I got, that just sort of fell out of the sky on me. But I don't want to have to be thinking ahead and planning and like, uh, I don't want to try anymore. Like that, that came to me, like it was a gift. It came to me, I'll take it, thanks. I can still do it, great. But you know, that all, the, all those years when I surfed all the time, gosh, it was, um, it was like, uh, you know, it was just being, on, it was sort of on that mission that you're on and it's, con it, it was, I was never not thinking about what's the next trip. What's, where do I go? I, I don't, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think anymore at all about how well I'm surfing. I understand that. You part. Know, so, but, but will today's session, um, doesn't it invigorate you and kind of no, re no, reset? It, it, it invigorate. It reminds me of how much, um, how much I love, and I'm going to use the word past tense, like how much I loved surfing and how much it meant to me. For the, I started when I was eight and I kind of stopped when I was 50. I didn't stop. I just stopped being surfing all the time. But that period, like that whole long, complicated, just crazed, obsessive period, like how much, I hated a lot of it. I got really frustrated with a lot of it. And especially the last eight or 10 years of it, I was just going, why am I still doing this? But for a long period, for 30 years, when it was the love of my life, when I have a wave like that today, I go, oh, that was why it was the love of my life. That was why I did it. You know, and again, I didn't do anything in that wave today. It just reminded me how good it feels to catch a wave and and it, and and ride it and feel like uh, the, the motion itself felt good. And and um, God, it just goes before that because before I even surf, when my uncle Daniel pushed me across the pool in in Tarzana when I was 
five or six and I stood up on his board and glided across the pool. I go, wow, this is, this is the best. This is the great. I want to do this. We moved to Venice a year or two later and, you know, then skip ahead 45 years and I was fine. And then I finally set it down. But I, that's how long it, and I, I said, you know, for the last 10 years since we moved to Seattle, 11 years, a lot of that time uh, I spend going over all that and wondering, God, what, that was that was something. That was, and then I have a, and then I, re, I need to remind myself, and that's what happened today. It reminded me of why why I did it. It doesn't make me want to go out and um, chase it down anymore. So you and I are twenty years age difference, yeah. approximately. Yeah. Um, I surfed earlier this week uh, for the first time in a month. And yeah, it, you, have, you have a newborn, so. Yeah, and um, I have a bunch of reasons for why I didn't surf that month, but it was the long, probably the longest stretch of time I've gone without surfing, really, ever. Right. And that session, I actually forced it. It was like, I have work to do. I should be going into the office, but I need this for just self-care, you know. And so How long I, had it been before that? A month. Okay. A month. Right, right. Uh, so I went, and it was just such a good. Re First of all, the waves were super fun, kind of like today. Nobody right, out, right. great conditions. Got a bunch of good ones though, unlike today. And it was a reset of, I just a smile was on my face. Right. It's all, all the cliches, right? And I and I just thought, this is uh, David. This is who right, I right, am. Right, right, right. You came back to yourself. All the rest of that month, I was just faking it, to be perfectly honest. Right. And the farther I got away, the harder it was to fake it. Right. And I can be kind and I can kind of have the same kind of worldview and all this stuff. But honestly, surfing is what sets all of those right. things for me. I need the exercise first right. of all. But in a, and it wasn't that I shredded a wave or anything no, like no, that. No, it I, was more just like being in the ocean and getting a little exercise and getting the sun and all that sort of stuff that goes with it. Um, so I, I hear you, what you're saying and it, I'm afraid to think that but that one month will become norm and then it becomes two months and then you don't even, it sounds like you don't even identify. Because like when I say I feel like David again, it's because David identifies as a surfer with right. all of these world That's views. the word. I, I wanted to bring the word identity in here. And you're still at a point where I, I didn't, I can't imagine. I cannot, when I was 40, I couldn't have imagined not doing it with the degree of like, with that ferociousness and that intent, I never, at 40, I thought I'll never not, it was inconceivable to me that there would come a time when I wasn't doing it at that point. In the next 10 years, it just started getting to be sort of diminished returns because to maintain that yeah. focus. But the thing that, so when you just made this face, like, oh, and, and I've said the same <laughs> thing to other people who are still in that where I used to be. And the thing that you have to remember is that if, is that if, uh, it still felt that way to me. I'd still be doing it. So in other words, when I, when I stopped, it was just pushing away from something where I felt like I've had enough. Like it didn't, so it didn't feel like I was, um, it no longer, it didn't feel like I'd lost something. I didn't, and look, you see, look, you look, can you, can there, well, can anyone see how skeptical you, like do I, we got yeah, a camera? There's a camera. Cause you, you look skeptical. Yeah, and well, I think well, it's because, with, is it because you weren't putting yourself in good waves? Were you just sur like you were surfing shitty waves? Not at all. Conditions? No, it, it had to do with like I go, God. Uh, so so okay. it would be different for different people. But for me, it was I had a kid at forty nine. Um, I had, I was starting at forty nine to um, either lose a step or at very best I was I would plateaued. I wasn't getting any better. I wasn't developing, and I really didn't want to put in the hours in crummy surf. Uh, to 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 keep my level where it was. So like for me, like stay, being good good at it was really important. And when I could see that that was gonna not just good at it, but like improving was really important. And when I could see that that wasn't gonna be the case, it just became really frustrating. Uh, and so I was an unpleasant person to surf with for the last you know like five years, where I like from forty five to fifty or whatever. I, I I mean I still had I was still I still had great moments. There was always. The bull, I, I could hit the bullseye now and then, but God, I had more and more times where I was out there just going, why am I still doing this? And da da da. And it was just harder to justify it. It was, it's a lot of time, man. It was just so much time putting into it. And I started resenting how much time it would take. And I also thought, God, 
you know, at this age, like maybe there's, I should try something else. You know, I should, and it, it turned out to be that mostly what I wanted to do was just work on Encyclopedia of Surfing, which seems like not much of a breakaway, but, but by not surfing all the time, I had so much more time to put into this project that I wanted to work on. I also needed to um, be better at being a dad and a husband. I wasn't a failure at it, but I knew I could do better if I wasn't surfing all the time. You know, I, up until 48, 49, I was still doing, telling those bullshitty kind of like little lies and, you know, coming home later than I promised I'd come home. And um, I just, you know, I, I wanted to do better at that part of it. Yeah. So, so, but, so, it's, it, uh, so I think our, the way that we treated it in our obsession of it was a little bit different. Cause I don't, I don't know that I was as obsessed yeah, no, I, as you were. I went, no, few. And so, so me now distancing myself, for, oh, like, I feel like I could find a happy medium. Like I, uh, derive tremendous pleasure from my, uh, relationship with Lauren and my relationship with Austin. Like those are more important to me than surfing by far. And I knew that prior to even getting in those relationships, I knew that was my life plan. Right. And so as those came, I quickly put surfing aside. But when I revisit surfing, I right. realize how much it informs me and makes me just better at those things but too. My experience has nothing, your experience, you're going to, you're going to find your own, uh, uh, way of layering all those things together. And you already, so there's like, whatever, uh, whatever I'm saying to you, this is not a thing that you're facing down yourself. You may end up surfing, um, three times a week until, until the end. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm not, so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, but I'm I, not a temp, my thing is not a template for anybody else. Of course. But I have to yeah, ask I mean, and engage you're, and, you're, and assess and all right, that sort right, of stuff. Right. Um, but I guess what I want to say is if you, if you, if you, if you do get to a place where you're thinking about, I don't want to do this at this level anymore. Don't then feel bad about it. Don't feel bad. Like I, you know, I, again, I have so, I have friends who are my age who are still surfing all the time and they and i was the most i was the most frothiest hardcore out right. of all those guys and right. so when i went to the other side it was like i'd been kidnapped for them they they were you know they they still can't figure it out like and, and it, all i say to them is like you know it, uh it wasn't but it, it, it wasn't exactly like i hit a switch when jody got the job and when we moved out of san francisco to seattle when i was 51 and that was that was the mark that was the point where it turned you know there were a few months in Seattle where I was bitter about it. I was resentful. I wanted to keep surfing a lot. I brought up, I, I brought up boards with me and da, da, da. But I pretty quickly thought this is actually the, this is the off ramp that I've kind of been looking for, even if I didn't know I was looking for it. And I let it go. And it was, it was, it felt great. Mm. And it, it didn't, I didn't need to feel like I had to be surfing and I, I didn't. And so when I say like today came to me, I, if I don't chase it, if it lands, it's like, you know, butterfly lands on my shoulder look at that look at that beautiful butterfly i'm so stoked thank you um and wait not, for the next wait for the next yeah not you know? setting up a butterfly sanctuary right. in the back but a lot, a lot of times what i do you know what what i really want to do uh what i miss and this is i i put this in a separate category is like i i don't really want to i don't want to i don't plan on going surfing on a board I really would love to just go body surf two or three waves a day in warm water. I would just, I want to, I would, what I don't like about Seattle is I'm not next to a place where I can just get in the ocean. So if I, I grew up in Manhattan beach yeah. <clears throat> and like I leave my brother's house, jog 20 minutes to the beach over the hill across PCH. And if the water's warm and I can just jump in and ride three shore break waves, get a little tiny shore break tube and then get sp spun around and there's feel like, that means a lot to me. That actually means more to me than, than tucking the knee and riding a wave to prove that I can still surf. Totally agree. And that's a consensus among so many people that I interview. Being in the ocean, right? And, and body surfing specifically. Right. Which, like which, they which, almost, you get elevated to a point where you don't need a board. Like the board is actually a distraction between you and the ocean. Yeah. I mean, it started off in the ocean, right? I, we, when we moved to Venice when I was six or seven, we, you know, we, my brother and I body surfed for a couple of years. That's what we did for first. And, and and I'm not saying there's some kind of cosmic full circle thing that's happened, but the rush that I felt at seven or eight, and it's not even riding waves. It's just getting tumbled and it's just going from, from, from beach to water and then jumping over waves, jumping under waves, and then occasionally riding a wave and then 
being slightly out of control when you wipe out and popping back up and swimming back, swimming back out and doing it and not giving it doesn't matter at all how like Phil Edwards once said something about how like the first you know the the first day you surf is the best day because on the second day you're trying to do better. And, so true. And by the, Man, that's he was smart. Right, and it wasn't. And I, I I don't for a minute resent that I spent all those years trying to get better. It was really fun. It was like playing like my son the way he plays games. He's always going to go to the next level. I loved going to the next level. Next level. High. How high can I keep going? But it's it it's a it takes a lot out of you to do it. You know, and I and and, and I. At 51, I was definitely, I was I was probably done at 45 wanting to keep getting better at it. it I'll never be done wanting to go in the ocean. Yeah, that's a great point. Summed it up. The reason why you're here, well, not the reason why you're here, you're here to visit family, but right. the reason why you and I get together once a year is the EOS fund drive is coming up, correct? Mm-hmm. EOS, again, I'm going to pretend like listeners haven't heard us talk before and that this is the first time they've intro- been introduced to you. Encyclopedia of Surfing. There was a book once upon a time. There still is, but it's now a website as well. EOS.surf. Mm-hmm. And that is your full-time project. Yeah. Do you want to give a mission statement? What's your objective here? To preserve. <laughs> Remember what I was just saying to you in the car about how hard it is for me to talk about my own thing. Mm-hmm. You just asked me for the mission statement and I'm sitting here trying to remember what my own mission statement is. It is uh to preserve, okay. celebrate, and occasionally goose surfing and surf culture. It's really all in the head in the title itself. The Encyclopedia of Surfing. Except except at this so the Encyclopedia of Surfing, the book was was just this big slab of it was like nine hundred pages of text with tiny little black and white photos, and you started at Camp Auburg and you ended at Frida Zamba. It was an A through Z. I remember telling friends, I go, I'm, I'm writing an encyclopedia of surfing. It took years to write. And Dan Dwayne I don't know if you were, you were interviewed. Inter- yes. Yeah. Um, Dan Dwayne and I were. He just got into the podcast game. Right. Is and, he doing. And, oh, he did the shark thing. Yeah. The, and right. so we interviewed him for that. Right. But I remember uh, Dan and I were really close. We were neighbors at that point. That's right. Yeah. And um, the book came out and I was exhausted and I'd been working on it for years and I was two years over deadline. And I handed it to him and he looked at it and he goes, Oh, you really did an encyclopedia. Like he did, he, I don't know what he thought I was doing all that time, but it, it was like, you know, it was a, it was three quarters of a million words, A through Z from, you know. So the Encyclopedia of Surfing website initially was just me trying to migrate the book over. But then I also brought in uh, another book I wrote called History of Surfing. And then I added a section which is all just QA, like you know, Andy Warhol's interviews kind of thing. And I added another section that's like, contest results so every result for every makaha contest that was ever held in the 50s 60s and 70s which incredibly enough had never been gathered in one place before so um i just opened up all these different sections the way disneyland kept opening up new you know adventureland tomorrowland so it's it's almost as fun (laughs) the joints is the sunday joints is fun encyclopedia surfing started off as just being the encyclopedia surfing but now it's much bigger and it's confusing because the encyclopedia surfing book lives within this much bigger encyclopedia surfing website anyway well the fundraiser it, it yeah. blows my mind that you're the only person who has taken the time to actually uh archive this thing it doesn't blow my mind you know i, I mean it doesn't it shouldn't there's no money in it i mean like who's gonna it's do a it it's labor of love and it's so tedious and there's only one personality type that would be equipped to actually yeah. do the task and unfortunately you're the only one the single human being on the planet. I, I love doing it. I love, I love even the tedious stuff. Um, we were talking about the Sunday joint in the car because yeah. like the, the encyclopedia of surfing, all the A through Z stuff is just, it's just sort of like a lot of that is, um, you know, it's history and it's facts and it's all this stuff that when you want to find it, there it is. Great. But still it's kind of, it's just kind of there sort of inert. It's like the sort of like the vegetables of my thing. And then the Sunday joint, which I do is the newsletter that comes out incredibly enough on Sunday in the afternoon. Um, that's me going into it in this other gear that I didn't think I wanted to mess around with, but it turns out I love, which is I'm trying to be uh, I'm entertaining about it all. So I'll go off on it'll, encyclopedia or the Sunday joint is like usually a, it's a 800 to a thousand word riff with links to the site, but it's me just going, going on about 
music or 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 uh, you know or a movie or something else I saw and c- connecting it all into contextualizing conte- right a lot and, of the and I just love love doing that and it's been a big hit and that is not um, vegetables that's just supposed to be really fun and I think it's and it's it's kind of like this newsletter that ate my website because the the Sunday joint was supposed to be me something I was just me dashing off a few paragraphs on Sunday before having my Manhattan with Jody to let people know what went up on the site the week before. And it's turned into this thing where it's like, now it's like two and a half days to get it the way I wanted and the right voice and the right images and everything. But that is um, the thing that I would like to believe that people are getting sort of the, the most out of. It's, it's also sort of the, uh, it's the gateway to the big part of the site. Like the yeah. joint is supposed to be like the, like the clown tying the balloons to get you to come into the museum sort of thing. I'm not, but yeah, I, or, I mean, you just, in today's world, you have to engage with people regularly, right? you know? And so the website's incredible and we will, people will support it just because it's important. We need it to exist. And I will reference it when I'm going to interview somebody, I'll pull it. That's the first place I'll go to pull up to find information on whoever I'm interviewing. Um, somebody else has to write the Matt Warshaw entry. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know whom, but, um, and so it will exist for that, but the proactive nature of what you're doing with the Sunday joint is, uh, well, it gives people a, a peek into your personality. Everybody, but everybody loves the encyclopedia as it is. Everybody agrees that all that stuff I'm doing should be online. Yeah, it course. should be there. And everybody sort of wants to support it to some degree. Yeah. But if I can do something, and I think I can because of all the years, all the stuff I've wrote, all the time I work at Surfer, all the, if I can do something that's that comes to you and goes into the the, the joint. By the way, is sent out by email. And it drops into your into your into your inbox once a week, and there's no other promo stuff that comes from EOS. And it's this thing that you look forward to getting. Yeah. And if you open it and read it, and right away you're, it's a Monday morning read for me. Yeah, it is for a lot of people, but it's like that's the thing that I think people um, like. If you if you if you cut them off from that, they would actually want. I I feel like I'm flattering myself. They would they actually want they want to read like like they people. Yeah. If I don't put the joint out at uh, at three o'clock on Sunday, I start getting emails. Hey, where's the joint? This no week? way. Yeah, and Funny. I love that. You know, so that's been the thing. And I I didn't think it was going to be as big. I made so so many mistakes on this. You know. 10 year thing since I've been working on EOS. And I remember early on, uh, Lewis Samuels saying, Hey, you should put out, you gotta, you gotta put out a thing about, you you have to, you you have to blog, you have to talk about what you're working on. I said, no, I'm just going to put, put the A through Z stuff up and put the history stuff up. It'll speak for itself. You know, so for years I didn't do a newsletter and like five years ago, I started doing it. And I came up with that name Sunday joint, which is like, I'm terrible at titles for things, but I love the Sunday joint because it had all these different, connotations it was like a juke joint it was a re, it was a joint that you smoke and it was and but the main thing was the sunday joint i think in 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 europe is after church you go over to somebody's house and they've smoked up a giant joint of beef or mutton or whatever and everybody gathers around and you around the sunday joint so that was the real i had no idea yeah so i i got so happy that i thought of something clever that actually makes sense that i, I got to write the sunday joint man and um it's ended up, I've ended up, you know, writing this thing that's basically supposed to be entertaining while at the same time um, crooking its finger saying, hey, come here, there's a bunch of links you should see over here yeah. too. This is like, this stuff all connects, you know, and it's <laughs> it's really fun for me to connect surfing to all kinds of other stuff. Like, you know, any, whenever we get stuck into surfing, like that whole, that, that stupid uh, ad in the 80s, like I think it was Instinct, that surfing is life, the rest is details. And like, you know, all of us bought into that, surfing is everything. It's that it's not you know you got it, it, it's so much better when you're bouncing it off of music and movies and, and architecture or or uh, or and i've actually written about architecture on the sunday joint so i'm not just pulling that out of my ass but you if you can bounce it off other stuff and if you can also uh and i can do this pretty well if you can also make connections between surfing's past and present and you see how how, how the sport uh is elastic enough that stuff that's happening here in 2022 is very similar to what was happening in 1922. And if you can see those connections throughout all the decades, um, for me anyway, like, again, like I was saying, looking back on all that amount of time, I, you know, the better part of my life that I spent surfing, I just feel better. Like, well, I know why I liked it because, uh, 
people have felt the same way about it for you know all this time, and I can just I can just sort of see what was attractive about it then and now, and how there's a through line to all of it, you know, and. So not, not a lot of people have the knowledge set or the savvy to kind of make that through line. So you're the right guy for the job, plus your tedious detail kind of scholastic approach to it all. Um, I am what I, I kind of re uh, learn all the time or is that there's so much that hasn't yet been archived. Oh my God. So, and, and so I know your hands are full and you're doing your best, but it's like, there's now Instagram accounts that are, um, publishing videos and or footage of surf magazines. They're just literally people who go through their old surf magazines, take a photo and publish it on Instagram. Maybe right. they include the caption, right. at least the photographer and all that. But I'm like, man, surf magazines, because there was only five internationally, let's say, of kind of like, you know, substance everybody's experience ran through that filter. Right. And those magazines actually took their job seriously. And right. so they honored the past. They gave that oral tradition and shared those stories. And we all had the same rites of passage. So everybody who entered surfing entered through kind of the same passage, you know? And there was a lot of benefit to that because we're all brethren. Right. So if I went surfing in Australia or Hawaii or wherever, it was like, we're all kind of part of the same, we all understand right. it the same way. Well, we it was entered, a water, we, it was like the water, the magazines were kind of like the water cooler. Everyone, everyone knew the same. And we all, by the way, when it comes, a set wave is coming, we all understand the hierarchy in the lineup. Right. Because we all kind of entered through the same ways and right. we know who the same icons are and all that sort of stuff. Right. And the media landscape has changed in a million ways. And so everybody kind of enters from their own path now. Right, right. And there's surfers who, their favorite surfer is Alex Denost. And right. they have no idea who John John Florence is right. or Noah Dean is. Right. And then there's right. people, you know, and the opposite people who only know the CT and don't know anything else. Right. People, there's just everything. And so I'm like, man, it's interesting that there's no uh, Wikipedia, let's say, for the surf world where you can just go and kind of learn. You could type in a word and learn who who Mark Richards is, right, you know, or right, whatever. Right. I mean, there is now with EOS, there is right. for Mark Richards, right. but there wouldn't be necessarily for lost films. Right. Like where well, would I next, go learn about lost films? The next thing I wanted, the thing that I want to do this year coming up and uh, I'll be mentioning this and I'll be fundraising on it. In fact, is EOS encyclopedia of surfing exists, but it's, it's sort of my, it's definitely my take on surf history and surf preservation. And it's all, uh, it's all uh, curated. Like I pick everything that sort of goes in. So if you go to Shane Haran, you're going to get a couple. Like, I almost I, said him instead of Mark Richards. There you go. That's oh. super weird. You'll get two or three videos that I made about that. I, I didn't make them. I, I grabbed, I grabbed the photos and put it out of the film and put it together and pick, and I picked whatever weird song I wanted to go with it, you know? So you're going to get a, a interview I did with Shane Haran in the eighties and you're going to get uh, his EOS page and you're going to get that history of surfing page in which he's in. No one's going to be able to like when he, when I'm, I'm working on this project the way, uh, who was that guy that built the Watts towers? No one's going to know what the Watts towers are. Yeah, I know what they are. I don't know who the guy was though. So it was just some crazy guy that just built up these towers in the middle of Watts for no reason. They just, they, they, it appealed to him and he built it up and it, it I hope it's still there. It it's was an art project, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's still there. So EOS has a little bit of that to it. And I, I decided a couple of years ago that when I either die or retire, EOS is just going to, um, I'm not going to shut it down. I'm just going to close it. It's going to stop growing and you put it up. It's just there for everyone to see like a 10 commandments. Well, if it was like, if it, in other words, if it had been a project, like say if it had been a book project, it just goes up there and there it is. It's a done, it's done. But this year I want to build um, a thing that I'm just calling EOS archive for lack of a, a better uh, phrase for it. And it's not complicated. I just want to build this structure, like a, I think of like a library, and I want to create a filing system. And I want to just start taking entire um, sort of chunks of surf history that are at risk of vanishing digitizes them and putting them Perfect. on the shelves. So there's a there's a surf magazine that some of your older listeners may know. It's called Surf Guide Magazine. And Surf Guide published in Santa Monica from 62 to, I think, or 63, 64, maybe a little bit of 65. And Surf Guide was so good 
that that basically John Severson found a way to put it out of business. John Severson loved the man, great every accolade you could lay at his feet, lay it on his feet. And I would say it's actually an accolade to also say that he was a killer when he wanted to be. So John Severson recognized that Surf Guide was a threat. And after 22 issues, John Severson managed, for reasons I won't kind of get into, but he managed to basically put him out of business. Did and he? then they did the smart thing and hired their editor and brought him over to Surf. Okay. Like to say he killed it, but let the editor escape and brought, him, brought Bill Cleary over to Surfer. So I, when I think about this thing, this EOS archive thing, I, my, it's, it's been in my head for years now that I want to take those 22 issues, scan them, uh, make PDFs out of them, make them all searchable. Uh, and that's the first thing that goes on the shelf. And then I don't want to run that thing because that's that is not curated. That is just say let's take Good. every Greg yeah. McGill every film, totally. to put it on the shelf. Let's every surfing magazine which hasn't been done. I'm somebody who's maybe already doing it in Australia for tracks. Every tracks magazine should be up there. And this project will be um, open to others to upload. I need other people to contribute. It's, it's way too big of a thing for me to do. But that thing EOS archive goes on after I'm done. Yeah. That's something that carries on. But that's the thing I really want to build this year. And I can't, for the life of me, believe that no one's done anything like that. There's so much stuff. There's so many books that that are that are not digitized and they're just surf history books that are just gathering dust on shelves and no one can well, see them. And, and, you know, so who, who would, or why would they, I mean, I've thought about doing it, but by the way, my plate's full and it's I know, like, I have right. all these magazines and it's like, okay, well I need to get rid of the physical copies. Right. I looked up how to buy the digital scanner. Turns out they're pretty cheap nowadays. They are. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, well, I could do that. And then I could also incorporate that into this business somehow and, or maybe at least Instagram or whatever. And it's like, it is a tedious time consuming project. It's a job. It's a, it's a, who's going to do it. So EOS now has enough, it's been around long enough and it's got a donor base and it's got a subscriber base. And I think it'll be supported by um, donors. I think it's something that, you know, I, I will, uh, it, it, none, of, none of what I'm talking about is especially it's expensive. It's just uh, building that, the, the structure I'm talking about, the digital the platform is simple. It's just a, you know, it's a searchable database and you want to make it look nice on the front. Got to hire an archivist. Well, no, you have to hire. Yeah, you, know, you don't have to hire an archivist. You you do have to hire or maybe bring on board um, uh, either a bunch of interns or you go to uh, a college and say, "This is you know, can, can we get some help loading up?" And you you want to probably hire. You want to probably want to get someone who can um, start getting grants for you. Okay. And you also want to go around to people like you know you and I know who who are rich surfers who do believe in this. And yeah. it, and I tell you who it's not because I've learned this from all the years with EOS. It's not whatever's left of the surf corporations, they don't, they've never supported EOS in the least. They don't, they don't care about it, but there are surfers of means out there who I think really think this would be a, you know, it would be a great idea. Yeah. And then at some point, because I can't do, I want to start that project, but I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to be on point. I want to be, I want to keep doing EOS. These are two, you know, the archive project is separate from EOS. They're sort of connected, but the archive, I think I would then try to um, partner up with somebody else and get them, another nonprofit, to take it over. Yeah. I just want to get it started because people people don't like, you know, it's hard to get. Everyone I've talked to says, oh, that's such a great idea. I can't believe no one's done it. And, but no one does it. So I'll, I'll do it. You know, I'm happy to do it. Good. Uh, I will support that. Our listeners will support that. And it's at a uh, surfing up until this point is at a size where it's doable. Like those, the number of those magazines exist and we can find them. We know where they are. It's also like if you, if you go like, if I, if I, if I, if I made the project a little more finite, which I may do and say, it's the, uh, the archive of 20th century surfing. So I don't have to be responsible okay. for, so in other words, what you're trying to do is get the stuff that was published and is really going to turn to dust. Right. So exactly. Okay. Perfect. Then, then I think, then I think, like it's a finite number of magazines. It's, it's a lot, but we know where they are. They we, they still exist. They exist, and it's it you know, and it's it's not. It's still it was still a pretty small sport for most exactly. of the last century. So know? we so, can still manage it now. Right, it will grow to the point that we can't manage it anymore. So right. So to, so anyway, but I like like you can like I was thinking like if you're if you're going out looking for someone to sponsor something, you say hey look, 
you, the, the archive gets broken down into smaller projects. Like the first one is going to be the, the surf guide project. I'm going to go ahead and get the surf guides all scanned and put up on the shelf. Totally. Who, who, then who can I get to to, uh, to back a much bigger project, which would be Surfing Magazine? Right. That's 50 years worth of magazines. Bigger project, but again, finite. It's a number. It's you know, and all it really is. And the is dollar it, amount that it required to do that also doable, fundable. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't even. I'm not going to even take a guess. But fundable. Yeah, for sure. No yeah, question. I, yeah, and and you know, you, do, you do the same for. Uh, all the Walt, Walt Phillips movies, all of the Hal Jepsen movies, you know, and you just start pit, you just start putting all these things on the shelf. Yep. Anyway, so that's that's what uh, I'm going to be uh, coming at everybody with for next year. Well, when does the fundraiser drive start? It's December twelfth uh, to twenty second. Ten days. Where do they send? Why? Why only ten days? Okay. I don't know. It's, let's let's people, have a real talk conversation. Right. EOS subscription. EOS dot surf to be. To support it, to have access to all the things that you're talking about, is three dollars a month. Soon to be five. five. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Five is nothing. Five is too small. No. Double it to six. No. Make it ten. Right. So whatever. It's three bucks a month, and then to only do a drive for ten days, do a drive for the entire month of December. Um. It's I more. Know. It's it's more down to I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I, you know, it's pretty arbitrary that it's 10 days, right? Everybody who just listened to the whole spiel is like, where do I send my well, they, money? No, they can, you're like, you don't, you know you don't have to wait till December of course, 12th. Of course, of course. On the site, there's a yeah. donate button and a subscribe button. And I, do, do, I get donations now and then throughout the year. Do it for but a month. The reason why I do it for 10 days is that that's all I do is, is for 10 days is just it. send out. And mostly what it is is just getting in touch with everybody. All the, everybody who's donated in the past gets an email, da, da, da. And, and I can't, I, I actually don't know if I could take 30 days of it. You know, it's, it's hard enough to do 10, 10 days of that, 10 days straight of, of, uh, of fundraising is. I'm envisioning a phone bank. I I'm know, working right? one phone. Chaz is working another phone. Right. All these other people you mentioned are working another phone. That would be actually a great idea to have people like, like the, like the telethon kind of yes. thing back in the day. Yeah. We could Jerry. Well, not yeah. Jerry, but Jerry Lee Lewis Did is he what die? I was going to say. Yeah. Was, Look at Jerry Lopez, even better. You know, Jerry Lee Lewis would have been better. Jerry Lewis was the guy. Jerry who, Lewis, sorry. But yeah. Jerry Lee Lewis just died, I think, two weeks ago. The yeah. killer. Yeah. The killer died. We'll get Jerry Lopez to do it. I, I'm just saying. I know. I'm envisioning. There's so many good ideas. Yeah. There's so many good ideas. I know. It's only right. so little time to. But implement. you were, I was saying to you when we were going surfing, you were like, oh, God, I, I know we got to talk about EOS, and I'm so bad at it because I like it's not that I, and you were saying, oh, if you don't. What did you say? You say, oh, if you don't care about it enough, talk about it. And I go, no, no, I care about it. That's all I want to do is work on EOS. Yeah. But I get, I'm not a good pitchman for this yeah, thing, yeah. you know. I think so you did I, a good I, job. I, I'll let you, when you do your intro for it, or your outro. Is that the dog? Yeah. I think, I think, Time out. You did a great job pitching the EOS, even though you don't want to. So okay. your job is done. All right. EOS.surf, right? That's it. Where do they go? Uh, www.eos.surf. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I do want to, I mean, we've gone, we've run an hour. We could end the show now, but I do have questions that mm -hmm. I prepped that I should ask you about or that I want to hear your opinion on because I discuss these things maybe with Chaz, maybe with other people. And uh, I would like to get your take on them. Far away. Uh, you, one of your Sunday joints was about is surfing hip. Oh yeah. It ended up actually becoming an article on beach grit. What Did was the premise of the article? And then I'll ask you specifics. The premise of my article was, yeah. yeah. Well, it's it was, I think I think that was one where I, this is going to sound not demeaning exactly, but I remember I got the song "What Is Hip" stuck in my head by Tower of Power. I love the song, and it's like I'm almost at a point now where I it, something comes at me and I go, uh, "Can I get a joint out of this?" And then. Um, Sam George wrote an article, and I love Sam. He and I have been friends since the 70s. We used to surf in WSA contests together, he and Matt. And I all got along great. Um, he wrote an article for Surfer called What is Hip, or is Surfing Hip, sorry. And the article was pretty good, but I remember I got to the end of it, and it was, the, the he wrote the article, and I, early 2000s maybe something like that or 2008 
I can't remember, in the aughts sometime. But the conclusion was, hell yes, you know, surfing is hip. It's so hip, you don't even know how hip it is. It's incredibly hip. And I just thought, are you kidding me? How can you, like, it wasn't hip back then either, you know? So it was just me getting that song stuck in my head, and I wanted to go revisit Sam's article. But what I really wanted to do was say, of course surfing's not hip and then I was trying to figure out in my head does that matter to me anymore like do I care if surfing is hip and my knee-jerk response is that is of course I don't care if it's hip who should why should you care it doesn't get in the way of me riding my wave but then if I think about it long enough I do care that it's no longer hip I actually do want surfing to be cool or and Mm. hip and cool I know are not the same thing but for this yeah yeah, I but you know I like I like I thought it was better when it was hip it just made me feel better to be part of it than when it does now it doesn't it's not a it's not a deal breaker that it's not hip but But, i did like it better when it was hip but did you enter surfing or develop your passion for it because it was hip was hip part of the draw yeah i think so sure because i started in 68 or 69 and surfing was kind of underground at that point because the shortboard revolution started and and uh everything was real anti kind of anti-commercial at that point at least in california and um, it, so surf, you know, in the, in the mid sixties, it was competition stripes and surf teams and all that kind of stuff. And, and when I got into it, it was stupidly anti like everything, which is, it wasn't that fun in a way, but it, it's, it felt cool. It felt like you were part of a counterculture. Right. So I, who, I did, so who were, who were the hip icons when you got into it? Well, Lopez was at the top. You know, and Reno Abalera was always super hip and cool. Um, Jeff Hackman wasn't hip, but we, but he, we, he, we all loved him anyway. BK Barry Kanapuni was the hippest surfer in history. And then you know the anti-hip guy who ends up being kind of hip in his own way was Mike Purpose because he was so garish and loud and and funny. Yeah. Um, so, what's your assessment on today, twenty twenty two? Is it hip? Do you think is anybody is anybody think surfing's hip right now? No. Nobody, no. I, I, I don't, so I don't know, Is any? does anybody? Sure, maybe people do. I look at it under a microscope, so I have a hard time kind of understanding what the gen pub right. sees it as. But to me, there is a, there has been, I will specifically kind of a, maybe rightly or wrongly or fairly or unfairly, point the blame at the WSL. Like there's been a WSLification of surfing that has been decidedly unhip, you know, and yeah. the, um, but I would just interrupt summed up on somebody else was good. If WSL didn't do it, somebody, I don't think that, but you, sh- but it's embarrassing that the WSL, because they are the arbiter of yeah. what should be the best surfing in the world. Right. And they've so far gotten distracted. And the W the finals day was kind of the perfect example of it. Or it was the s- culmination right, of it right, right. where they got Chris Cote to stand there like Bruce oh, Buffer, boy. That was the surfers themselves were embarrassed. Horribly embarrassed. They were just looking at the ocean. They're just like, I'm just going to. I remember literally calling Jody and going, oh, my God, you have to see this. Look what they're doing to these guys. This is the final day. This is like, look, look, what, look what's going on right here. And it was. The fact that they thought that was a good idea is insane, right, first of all. Right. But the surfers were looking at the ocean because they realized, okay, the UFC fighters look at their opponent. Right. The ocean. It, didn't, it doesn't make it's, sense. It's man versus nature, woman versus nature. So I'm going to look at the ocean because right. that's really my opponent. But the WSL missive was stand across each other like Bruce Buffer and we'll get Cote to do it. I don't know why Cote said yes to do this. I mean, of all the things that have been asked to do along the way, well, that's one where they would have handed me the script and I'd go, you know what, you guys? Yeah. Hand it to somebody else. I don't think Chris would say no to that. I don't. I, I don't know. But I don't it, know where. I don't is, know where his line is. I, well, I don't. I don't either. But I'm just saying, like, it became a farce. It was already a farce, but that was a moment where I was like, "Are you kidding me?" Well, there was also like, weren't I think, remember noticing it right from like maybe the first heat, like the minute they were just hopping off the stage way before you. They, you the, the insult, the shade, the, the shade thrown was. See ya, I'm out of here. And they're just jumping off the stage and going surfing. Because again, the surfers all know it's man versus nature. It's woman versus nature. The opponent is secondary. What I'm saying is if they had not done that really cringy way of doing it, you would have had them stand there looking like, okay, when can we go surfing? But because it was that cringy, 
I think they all hopped off that stage as seconds quick as they could. seconds before they would yeah. have otherwise. Like yeah. they made that totally. But but I agree with you. But my point is specifically that the surfers understand the core tenet of drama, which is man versus nature, and there's no other sport that can actually. Uh, provide that level of drama, that level of intrigue, interest. The WSL is the one who doesn't realize that. Yeah, they, but the so, WSL is the one who's like, let's run finals day at lowers. I know, I know. Or let's run in wave pools. Let's run you, at beach breaks around the world. Once you've, once you've signed on to run events in wave pools and at lowers, having Chris Cote make a, you know, do this ridiculous Bruce thing, is, all, all you're doing is putting... I mean, you've already, you've already lost it. You've already missed the... You've already Completely. missed the point. And, and and again, the, the thing so, that's so amazing to me about that is that uh, the the way to do it, they stumble upon it now. Every now and then, they just do it exactly right, not through any action of their own, but because uh, because Chopu or Pipeline or something gets really good, and then you know they've got all the cameras in the right places, and and the score, the whole thing with the. Uh, the best two waves is, a, you know, when I was younger, it was best four waves or best yeah, five yeah. waves. The best two waves was a great idea. The priority thing is a great idea. Man on man is a great idea. And let me just add, I hate overlapping heats because I don't want to have four people. It doesn't. So they've got, we never almost, you know, rarely do we talk about how many things they do right. Because when you do something as wrong as have finals day at trestles or in a wave pool it doesn't matter how many right things you do after that it, you, you can't overcome that oh that's all true i'll go a step further though by saying that if you just do the core tenant right everything else sus figures it out figures itself out so if you just run the surfers at pumping cloud break pumping pipeline pumping chopes yeah g land yeah. j bay yeah. there's kandui there's a couple we really quickly identify who the best surfer in the lineup is. Right. Or certainly the best five surfers out right. of 32. Right. Which is way too bloated. Right, right, right. right. No question. Right. We'll figure out the, you know, right. five out of 32, but very quickly, two out of those five. Right. And so now, sure, let's put a little, let's put a little criteria on top of that. Okay, let's go 30 minutes. Let's find the right. best two waves and we'll really pinpoint who the best is. Right. But if you just put them in pumping surf, everything else you don't have priority squabbles you're not trying to figure out the difference between a five five and a five seven i love like all you that. are I mean, newcastle I love all that stuff i think like i think the priority i think all the stuff if we have good surf if we just say let's i love all of the bad i i, I like the bad calls as well because that's going to give us as fans it's like the it's like the umpire at home calling the guy safe when he was out like how much fun is it to then talk about it also so we have a whole qs tour for that I'm just saying, like I'm just saying that, like a lot of the stuff. If you if the surf's good, um, uh, I there, there I don't mi I don't mind that the rest of it doesn't go perfectly. I, you know, best two waves makes sense. Half hour heats makes sense. Um, judging's they're, they're never gonna you're never gonna have a thing where the judging is agreeable to everybody. You know, and no, but it's a lot easier to figure out who got the best wave at pipe than it is who got the best a, ride at Merriweather. Hundred percent. Or, right. or Brazil, since Brazil's on tour every year. But, the, you know, the, the hip thing is also... it's Okay, uh, so back to hip. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's the, the, the WSL is definitely anti... Is, is, is The antithesis of cool. Right. Uh, and it doesn't... Need, it really doesn't need to be that way, but... but it would be better off not... It would be in their best interest to not be that way. They don't, they so. don't understand. But they, I, don't see how, I don't see how they could... I don't see how... They could. I, I keep thinking. I keep giving them the benefit of the doubt. So I keep thinking they know something that we don't know. No, like, I don't. No. Right? No. No. So this well, is, well, then that would imply that there's a vision, and you can try to tell me what that vision is. I, I don't know. I mean, when when they when they, it's not necessarily a vision. It's a. It's there. Uh, there are um, barriers or hurdles or there's things. There's things that they know that we don't know that force their hand. I'm just playing. Tripping, dude. I'm playing devil's advocate yeah. here. You're tripping. You know, I think I, maybe I am tripping. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I mean, again, they used to have the final at Pipeline. Like, in what they world? They opted out. I know. In what world? When when that's already a thing. But is there something there? Is there no. something underneath that that we don't know about? Do you think their no? own bureaucracy? But why would their own bureauc bureaucracy pick trestles? There, there, there's some logic in their head about why they're doing it. What's the logic? What is it? If you were, uh, 
if you're Elo, what is he? What would he say right now? Well, he'd say he'd, he'd give would, you he'd give you an eight minute answer that distracted you and pointed to all the yeah, but, successes. Okay, but so what? This, what made them say, let's move it? I, I get the one day final thing. I, we can talk about whether it's fair or not, but I get it. But why not have it at pipe? Why have it at trestles and not pipeline? Great question. No, what's the, I'm saying, I'm not saying this. What is, WSL has a reasoning and maybe we don't know what it is. And even if it's like, what is uh, WSL's reason? No, uh, I, I have no idea. I have no idea what the reasoning for that one would be. Anyway, so they're they're not hipping shut. They're not hipping. They, so they were, up, but they were texting with me four years ago, like, "Hey, what do you think of this idea to do this finals day thing?" And I'm like, "It's very interesting. Uh, I didn't foresee all of the things that are very clear to us now of the shortcomings of the finals day concept." But I was like, you know, I think it could work. On a boat trip, I specifically right, said right. on a boat trip in Indo where there's rights and lefts and it was kind of a open window of days that you could run. You and three, maybe, You have three rounds or something like that? Yeah, you, and maybe yeah. it runs at Greenbush for a round, maybe right, it runs at right. Lance's Ride for right, a round, right, whatever. Like, right. I think that could be very interesting, but all of my direction or feedback was waves. It has to be in pumping surf. Uh, and it has to run in a window where there's going to be swell during that. You know right, what I mean? Right. So that's all of my arguments ever come from are just put them in the best waves in the world. I know. Like you can't mm -hmm. have the best surfers in the world fine tuning. It's a Ferrari. John, right. John Florence, Jack Robinson right. are finely tuned right. Ferraris right. that can only, there's a fraction of the surfers on the planet, all, I'm virtually zero, who can actually do what those guys can do at North Point, Chopu, right. Kandui, all, right. Pipeline. And so asking them to go surf Surf Ranch or Brazil is putting them in a go-kart. I agree. And then going, okay, now go show us that you're the best in the world. And those guys are like, wait, I've spent 20 years fine-tuning this right. thing. And so it's a disservice to the sport. It is regressive for the sport. And so stab high on the on the other side are Vans doing their pipe masters right. this year, kind of rethinking the wheel and going, okay, we're going to take these specialists, put them in the best possible conditions for what they do and let them progress. You see them I, elevating one another. I know, I know, I get that. But I also say I, I can't be, I, I still really... Only want to see it where it's leading to the world title. I don't. I. I it's not hard to create a. I, it's I, not, I know it's not interesting if the. I mean, no offense, but a Connor Coffin takes out John John Florence in Merriweather and whatever and Rotnest or whatever, right, other, right, and right. then ends up in finals. Day. I know. It's like no, we know that there's a Ferrari and there's I, not a Ferrari. I know. How is it possible that the non Ferrari makes it as the fastest car in the world? Sometimes if I come upon like a backdoor shootout or one of those one day, like those one offs, if, if I come upon it, uh, I remember the, the contest they had at ours one year, what was like toe in slab surfing, like the Red Bull does an event there. I, I'll just go, oh, wow, well, I'm, I'm going to spend a few hours and watch this. But by and large, I just really like the, I really like the whole thing. Here's this, you know, like, like a baseball season. I want to, I want that 10 event thing leading to. But can't to, you do that in good waves? No, that you can. I'm just saying, but I also don't, like, I don't care enough about the specialty events to like care enough who's no, no, going to no. be it in the band. No, no, doesn't have to be a specialty. No, no, but I, but I don't want to watch, like, I, the people that are doing these great contests, good for you. Like. The WSL could do that. I know, but they, I, I, I can't, I'm, I'm tired. I, I, I'm too old or I'm too tired of discussing why they i don't okay. know why they can't yeah, yeah yeah it's but it's it's insane to me it just keeps happening and you know what i'm just gonna tune in and just keep watching anyway i i watched every heat at trestles and i can't say that i i mean I, but did seemed, you watch brazil no right so you didn't watch every heat of the year but you no, would if it was in good surf 100 percent. at cloud break you'd watch jay bay you would watch yeah. yeah that's kind of my point so the news story that broke two weeks ago about netflix right making a bid in the WSL, mm -hmm. not following through the deal. Chaz and I discussed that and we're like, man, imagine what the Netflix would do. Mm -hmm. Netflix understands how to make compelling television, mm -hmm. clearly. Imagine what they would do. The debacle this past year of the WSL not getting waves at GLAN would right. never have happened. Netflix would have been like, how much does it cost right. to rent out that place for 
right. two weeks. Right. WSL is balking because we don't want to rent it for two months. Right. And right. get the great swell. There was right. great swell before. There was great right. swell after. Right. No, they can rent it for two weeks. They can only afford that. That's it. You know, and then we get sh no waves. And then they run a terrible event as right. a result. Right. Netflix wouldn't balk. Right. They'd be like, rent the thing for two months. Who gives a crap? Right. right. You know what I mean? Like, right. it's a it's a tiny, it's a pittance compared to what we're spending on whatever else. So rethinking kind of what it would look like under that scenario they would end up with the best surfers in the world, riding the best waves in the world and a very clear champion at the end of it. And it's like, that's cool. I mean, that is cool. Talking about hip, bringing it back I to know, hipness. I know, I know, like I, when I, I when I watch When I watch uh, Garrett McNamara's 100 foot wave thing on HBO. Right. I'm gobsmacked. Right. I, I mean, and right. I, I don't necessarily think that Garrett McNamara is hip or cool, right. but I, I'm like, this thing is men riding mountains. Right. Like, it's insane. Well, you're playing to a surfing strength, and WSL doesn't play to the... WSL never plays Not to the strength surfing. of surfing. It plays to what they think is a sporting ideal, which it doesn't work That's very the well. disconnect. Because right. to me, it's not... It is a surfing strength, but it's distinct to surfing. There's nothing that's else what I'm, that's on what the I'm, planet that's what I mean. that right. is this cool. Right. Like, the reason I got into it not the reason I got into it, but a large part of the draw for me was just the the machismo in it. Right. Like there's a John Wayne in it. Right. That right. I was born a hundred years too late for. Right. Or whatever. That it's like I'm not going to be riding horses on the old west, but right. there is a confrontation with nature that you are, you know, uh, subjecting yourself to and trying to better. So. I think that uh, that just, that's what's hip about this it. Guy, that guy, who, uh, a guy died a couple of weeks ago named Kemp Auberg, who was a, just a great surfer and a Malibu surfer from the late '50s and early '60s. Surfed a lot with Dora and Mike Doyle and those guys, and uh, and they were. Somebody asked Kemp Auberg about like because surfing went through this huge explosion uh, in the early and mid '60s, which is getting bigger and bigger, and everybody was just as pissed off as you or I or anybody else is about the crowds at that point, especially at Malibu, right? And Kemp was complaining about it a little bit. He said, you know, on the other hand, of course it was going to get huge. It's so much fun to do. Like, like wh why would... So I, 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 Kemp was just saying, there's no blame here. It's yeah. like... So the other thing we haven't talked about in terms of making surfing less hip is if you're surfing... If you're selling boards out of Costco for... Much hundred, board. hundred bucks, hundred bucks. I think that Lopez is two hundred, but the wave storm. All right, is so you get a wave storm for one hundred fifty bucks, whatever. Hundred, hundred bucks. Okay, and you know, the, the last time I was in Hawaii uh, last winter, uh, I got COVID, had to stay an extra week. It was fine. Jody and Teddy went home; they didn't catch it, and I didn't have a bad case, so I just had to stay in the you know where I'd been, isolate a bit. I wasn't that sick. I I kept walking down and jumping in the water and just watching TV. And I wrote a Sunday joint. And the last day I was there, when I had to go home, when I was feeling better, the surf came up, not big, big, but pretty big. Uh, and I and went out and just surfed uh, pinballs. It was like, you know, pinballs inside Waimea. And it was, you know, like double overhead. It was something like that. It went, but it's, a, it's, a, it's just a big, mushy, like San Onofre dumb wave but sunset was pretty t sunset was too big for what i wanted to do and i went and looked at it was actually really good lania kea but if you've ever seen lania kea it was like going from way out almost by jocko's all the way like super fast guys riding seven sixes older super good older surfers just going straight lining mach four no way was i going out there so i go well i'm just going to go home because there's no way for, no, nowhere for matt to surf want 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 and it was a beautiful morning and i'm driving back to go pack and I go oh there's pinballs, no one's out. And it, it's just, again, it's just a dumb yeah. wave. But I, you know, I pulled in, unloaded. I go, bitch, and I'm going to go through pinballs. I went out, rode three waves, pulled out of a whole lot because I'm out of shape and I still had COVID. Got a wave, one last wave in, and I, I it was glorious. And it was Waimea Bay, even if it's only pinballs. And I'm walking up the beach, so happy that I had had this experience and feeling that connection in the bay. And blah, 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 God, I'm so happy. And the guy that's walking by me to go out, you know, Mason. No, it was a it was a just a, a touristy guy oh, holding no. a way a, a wave store. And I go, wow, I've just had this magic moment with this trip with this classic surf break. And he was the nicest. He goes, Hey man, I saw that last wave. It looked fantastic. You enticed him. It's, it's so beautiful out there. And, and and I go, 
It is, man. Have a great time. And all I can think of, he he gets to go out there now and have a great time. I don't begrudge him that. He he drove past it, saw it, and he wants to go surf it too. Like, why wouldn't he want to? So that was what Kemp Aubrey was saying, right? Like, surfing was too great to ever be a, I mean, to be hip or cool kind of has to be smaller. It has to be this little secret thing. Like surfing, Surfer Magazine had this cover story in 1978. And it was a backlit photo of a guy at Honolulu Bay. And the only cover blurb, it was a beautiful photo. It was a, in fact, I think it was a gatefold. Backlit photo. Okay. And, it, and, the, and the only cover blurb was the secret thrill. And it, you know, it's a little sort of poetic. That's a de- t- total Steve Pesman, the secret thrill. And, you know, in 78, it still kind of was secret. Like that guy was just a, the, the point of him being backlit was there was no stickers on his board. It was just a guy riding a beautiful wave by himself. And it's too nice of a sport to think that that's actually the thing you do. What you usually do is you're out surfing with a bunch of people on Costco boards because it's so bitching. Why wouldn't they be out there? So, so my point is, is that it we're was, making the same point. My point I, is I that it's too fun. It's too beautiful. It's too good for its own cool preservation. You can't keep that thing cool and hip when it's this enjoyable. Everyone's going to come in and do it, you know, and you just got to, I didn't make, I never, I, here I am sounding like, you just got to make your peace with it. I never made my peace with it. When I was surfing a lot of, ah, I got cool with these people, sheep, and they, everyone's following me out like a bunch of sheep. And I would just paddle down the, to the next peak, grumbling. Yeah. You know, if someone came close to me, I never, said shit, but I would just glare and, ah, man, you know, and fuck, what an idiot, you know? I mean, I, I'm definitely not mad at the Costco guy showing up. I made small talk today with a guy when, before he paddled mm-hmm. out a guy in the blue kind mm-hmm. of mini mal with plastic fins mm-hmm. lumbered into a wave. And I was like, okay, sweet. That guy's not a threat. I'll go sit next to him. But I made small talk with him and he was super nice. I'm not begrudging that guy either. What, uh, my my concern is, is I want to ensure that the value for the arbiters of the sport, whoever they may be, WSL, Ben Gravy, Jamie O'Brien, the arbiters of the sport should be venerating what is unique about it. And the, the man and woman versus nature and the kind of conquering that thing is what is actually very cool and also very unique and distinct. So I, I'm just going to... Making, it a, I'm, I'm making gonna, it a sport. I agree. I agree. And, I, and so, Making it a sport and just like every other sport and trying to draw all these parallels and connections is... You're missing the point entirely. What I talk about with EOS... If, if we're just trying to figure out who can exhort more willpower over their surfboard in a pool like a gymnast... So. That's the opposite. Right. So you've got to the thing that gets up in me way more than WSL, way more than Costco, which is everybody going nuts over the pool because I feel like the only thing that surfing really has going for it is, is the ocean, is that we're, we're leaving the beach, going to the ocean, and it is literally connected to a something that's taking place a week ago and 2,000 miles away. And how weird and how incredible is that that you're there's a storm the storm comes and you get to ride this last gasp of a wave like that is uh amazing and it and it and it you know and 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 figuring out what you have to do to be able to ride that to be able to find more of that thing is that's the whole thing we've made how our it fits into your life as right. we talked about earlier so the minute, and, and everybody getting excited about pools, and it's weird because I have this sort of split in my mind because obviously like the uh, the Waco pool where it's just people, you're just riding, a sh- you know, you're riding 30 waves in an hour. Yeah. And, and that to me is a really different thing than what, 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 what Kelly did in, in Lemoore, which is to out nature nature. Like when you've made a better wave than the waves that, all of us lost our shit over at Cape St. Francis. When you've outdone Cape St. Francis, like, sure, you did it. Great. Now what? Like, now, so instead of that being a once in a lifetime thing that happened, or, or instead of perfect surf being something that you talk about with other people, being, I hate, I hate the cliche, but it being that kind of unicorn experience, 
Now, perfect surf is just how much money do you have and who do you know? Doom, boom. And every wave, every wave that, you know, press the button, press the button, press the button. And at what point, then, that, then, it's, there's, then there is no perfect surf. Then, you, then you're just, uh, all you've done is made a half pipe thing, right? Exactly. So that drives me, like that conceptually, I don't really care what WSL does to surfing. I don't really care what the, what Costco does to surfing. But the idea that wave pools become a, an even bigger part of surfing and I think it's already happened. Makes me just say, well, and I'm not going to, I can't fight it anymore. I'm just saying, no, well, that's too no bad. Fighting. It just, it just, that's, they've really. Well, there's, not only is it becoming a bigger part of surfing, my really, con, my real concern is that it becomes surfing. I don't think it will, but it. It, it know, becomes what to, other people, like right. motorcycle riding used to exist. Out, <coughs> uh, or like uh off-road motorcycle riding existed in the desert, enduro riding, right? Right, right. And now it's super cross riding. It's going around a track and running around. Exactly. Yeah. And with fans, with spotlights and all that sort of thing. So it's like, if surfing becomes that, it would be a shame because what it is now, it's so disparate. And and what it is now is so uh, virtuous, by the way. Like it has all of this inherent, for whatever... Um, constructs that society has forced you and I to live by, we can still have this little sanctuary thing over right, here right. that we go in and it's like, wow, okay, this is remindful of hunter gatherer society and meritocracy right. and all this sort of thing. And as it shifts more towards just what the rest of society right. is and that belief system and res lack of respect for the hierarchy, all that sort of thing. It's just like, it's sad to see because this was the last vestige. When you asked me what the, the mission statement of Encyclopedia of Surfing was, and I said, uh, you know, it's to preserve, present, and archive surf, <laughs> surf history and surf culture. I can't remember it. But the truth of the matter is, is that what I, what I see in my own work with EOS that is the, the through thing all the way through it is that um, the sport is worth... Uh, celebrating and and worth presenting as this thing that is really different from everything else like the, the uniqueness of it and you and i today at our secret spot not too f in the middle of orange county we went out and had a small adventure in the middle of orange county we surfed a wave we surfed a little peak by ourselves at a time where you know uh and how did, like, that just seems, and I didn't think I was going to surf today. So this all just happened, da, 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 da. And what a, what a weird, wonderful, cool little moment that was. That yeah. We went out and got some waves to ourselves, in a, you know, and, and that's the same thing that's been happening in surf, the fluky, weird things. And, and on the flip side of that is, all the time I spent a shit ton of money to go somewhere and got skunked yep. or all, all the, t all the surf trips that I took where I got almost nothing, you know, so take the good with the bad. But the point is we've all dedicated ourselves to this completely pointless activity and great. That's, you know, it's not a, it's, it's a fun way. It's an interesting, fun, unique way. Let's just concentrate on the word unique. Cause that, and what I love is that what happened to us today isn't far off from what would have happened to somebody in surfing, wave pools aside, as far back as you want to go. So, you know, somebody back in ancient Hawaii was expecting to go just, you know, pick taro root and, oh, shit, look, the surf's good. And, uh, well, I, you know, lying to whoever they had to lie to to go down and get a few waves and then come back and feel better. And so. My grandfather. Uh, what's that? My grandfather. He was born in Kauai. Well, there you go. He wasn't picking taro, it was sugar cane. Um, that part of like, like, like putting uh, putting focus on that whatever it is in surfing that makes it uh, uh, different from everything else refuge is, is worth not even a refuge it will, is, is worthy of that that's worthy of all my attention you know from now on and so I my all my cynicism that I just expressed in the last thirty minutes was uh, it's new to me in the last couple of years since I turned forty. I think I'm more cynical now than I used to be, but it um, doesn't distract from my personal experience with surfing. Right. I still go, I surf, I surf by myself all the time. Surfing with you today was weird. Like I'm normally just by myself. I don't At that go same spot. No, not, no, right. rare, rarely there, right. but I just surf by myself all the time. 
and um, the wave storms don't bother me. None of that. But it's when I then go home, open the computer, and see how surfing is being portrayed to the outside world. But if you that weren't, doing, pot, if you weren't doing this professionally, you could just tune it all out. I okay. absolutely could tune it out, and or I could move to Central California or the Pacific Northwest. Right. Uh, but surfing to me is the refuge where it's like, well, I could still be an active member, contributing member of society right. in a very productive area, Southern California, and serve all, like, you know, do all these other things that the modern man does, but still have this refuge. Right, right. If I didn't have this, honestly, if I didn't have surfing, there's a good chance I would move far away from Southern California and just be a hunter. I would, I would get into hunting. I would get into rock climbing. I would get into something else that tried to satiate that. But you feel strongly enough about surfing that what you're actually doing here is you're pushing back. You're defending. Well, discussing you're, you're about of, it is the pushback. What I'm saying, right? But you, yeah. you, you are. We are. We're hopefully articulating something that a lot of people feel. That maybe you know, like we're pushing back on. I don't, yeah, it's a great, lot of lameness. You know, and I think I think people that come from our generation feel that way. I don't know how many people who discovered surfing since COVID feel. I don't either. That's yeah. a that's a mystery to me. Yeah. It is right. So and I, you know and and I, I guess I hope that if someone started surfing during COVID and someone said, oh, you should check out this site or maybe you should check out this podcast, they're going to get a different version of surf than that would they get if they go to the WSL site. So I think there is sort of, I'm not, I'm not trying to justify what we're doing, doing, but your podcast is going to be the first, like when someone says, oh, is there a good surfing podcast? I love podcasts. I've just started surfing last year. I love podcasts. What, what can I, oh, go listen to Surf Splendor. Yeah. And maybe they're going to hear us talk and maybe they're going to go look at EOS and maybe they're going to get a different sense of like, oh, I, you know, I love surfing. I didn't really know, realize that it, maybe this, is, I, I kind of love it because I really love going into the ocean and it has nothing to do with, you know, yeah, I, I do like the con. And so, well, for those people who just discovered it and heard this episode, I'd say, go back and listen to Dick Metz, hear him talk about discovering all the things that he discovered. Go back and listen to Derek Hines episode. I think he had a lot of interesting things to say and context kind of building Jamie Brissick has a, had a lot of interesting things to say on here. And I would More, say go to EOS and read the Vicki Williams uh, interview. She was a woman who surfed at Malibu in the 50s, and she was she's still alive. She's so fun. So should, Vic, should I interview her? 100%. Yeah, Where is she? She lives in Idaho, I think. So Zoom. Yeah. Or a she's ski awesome. trip. She was, she, was, she, was married to two, she was married to the, uh, remember the Green Hornet TV show? Yeah. No, it's way before your time, but you know you. Well, and, I know it. Yeah. But the Green Horn, it was Van Williams. So her name was uh, Vicky Flaxman, and she rode Malibu before Gidget. So she was like Gidget, and she's still pissed off about this. She, she is fight. She's ninety one, Vicky, and she's so fired. And she just she'll just say, "Oh, Gidget, like Gidget got all the attention." Like there was like four or five girls, and I mean girls, sixteen year old high school girls who were. Uh, getting these hot new boards from their boyfriends who happen to be Matt Kevlin and Tommy Zahn and riding Malibu on better, lighter boards than anybody. And they, they really did it when no one was paying attention. Vicky's because I get you get all the attention. We were there before, Vic, before Kathy got there. Da, da, da. Um, fuck, where was I going with that? But she, she's, you know, like you, you said, it. go read for new listeners who have just discovered the podcast and or EOS, go read that. Yeah, Vicki Williams. Vicki Williams flex. Oh, no, she was married to she was married to the Green Hornet, Van Williams. Yeah. So she she was just just big, broad shouldered, just Amazon of a woman. And uh she was attractive but huge, like a like and, and men just fell at her feet, you know, and and uh she was super athletic and she's just a and she's still that way and she's 90. She plays pickleball every day. And I you know, I talked with her on the phone a bunch and I had this woman who I'm working with with EOS interview her. And when I think about is surfing, you know, is surfing hip or is surfing cool? Like, I think that if, if it's still interesting to Vicky or if she, if like the thing that caught her eye, that's when, that's why we should do it. Cause she, and she's had this whole life in which surfing was sort of a huge part of it at first and then it became less, but it, she still thinks about it all the time. She still loves talking about it. And, um, I feel like as you know, if surfing means Vicky, uh, Vicky Williams, then you know we're good. She vouches for the rest of us. Did you watch Stab High's uh, the recent Stab High in the finale where 
Sierra Kerr wow. one. Yeah, I saw I saw the clip of her doing the full rotation. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. And a couple of other of the competitors in that great setup for the next 10 years of um rivalry mm -hmm. in women's surfing. Like I've never been more excited. Mm -hmm. So yeah. My mom just showed up with the big boy All right. and the dog's barking about that. Um, so we okay. should Okay, and I uh let's let's uh cheers. See say see you in, on episode five. Yeah, we'll and let's eat time. some meat and cheese. I love it. Okay. Thank you, David. Yep.